Welcome to the Mix Minus Podcast. It's Matt McQueenie. Welcome back, Matthew O'Daniels, podcast extraordinaire. Matt, we have not done this as much as we have in previous years, but we always have this one, the big poll preview. And we're doing this on Saturday, December 17th. So we're actually a little late because it's the first day of bowls, but as we look through the bowls, there's not a lot of great bowls until like the 28th. So I think we can kind of uh, gloss over those with maybe a couple of points, but we're going to focus on the big bowls. Uh, college really seems, especially this year, to be a league of or a uh, um, uh, an organization of have and have nots. You know, the haves are amazing, the bowls are unbelievable, um, and the have nots are truly have nots. But before we jump in, you are uh, almost done with your Connecticut School of Broadcasting, I believe, and you've been doing a lot of podcasting. How has that been? You've been on the road. You've had your own channel. What are you? Uh, what are you taking away from that? It's a lot of fun, actually. I'm learning that. Um, I'm learning that people will commit and say, "Yeah, well, let's do it," and then they won't. And then, so I'm learning how to navigate that. I've got 15, 14 or fifteen episodes. I've got three scheduled for next week, <clears throat> and uh, it's been a lot of fun. And finish up in February with school. And uh, going to be looking at some internships and uh, poking my head around. I think it's uh, I have a good feeling about uh, the future in that aspect, and uh, it's been a great experience. It's a lot like online dating, right? You see, you know, you sign up for Match, and then you're like, "Whoa, I could see myself dating a lot of these people." And then you're, you know, you're winking at them, you're trying to contact, and maybe one out of fifteen <laughs> get back to you, or one winks back at you, and then they go quiet, and then you're like, "Is it me?" Is it them? Are they a nervous person? Maybe they don't want to do this, but they feel bad saying no. It's it it's actually a lot more anxiety ridden than you would think, right? Um, I I guess it, it's it's funny because the 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 podcast that I do, like the, it's more or less interviews that I do. I think they just work out when I don't plan them because there have been there have been two two uh, episodes that I've done that were set up by other people who are trying to help me out who we were like Matt you should talk to this person so that wound up happening and working out well whereas sometimes when I go chase it's it's like to no avail or you know uh, the recording won't transfer I mean that's happened to me twice which is uh, kind of frustrating but I guess better learn now than later it's a lot like the real world sometimes that uh, that referral makes all the difference um, you know it's, yeah it's it's it's, it's kind of crazy how that works now um, I know you went to Pittsburgh. Did you go to Pittsburgh to do podcast episodes or did you go there and then make podcast episodes happen? Yeah, I went there and made uh, some episodes happen. I could have really done a few more, but it was also a little bit of a mixed trip in that uh, leisure trip. Uh, time to get away. My buddy who lives down here in Charlotte with me is from Pittsburgh. I hadn't been back in about two years, so... He uh, asked if I wanted to come up with him, and it was a it was a fun trip. Uh, Pittsburgh's a, an, an interesting city, and uh, actually went to a Penguins game <clears throat> that uh, that Pittsburgh Paints Arena, whatever you call it, the console, the former console Energy Arena is pretty nice. Uh, Rangers beat the Penguins. I mean, it was a it was, it was a nice city and a lot of history, a lot of history, and um, a lot of fun. And you interviewed a guy from the '98 Yankees. Yeah, Todd Erdos. It was crazy. My buddy's aunt is works with him at a, at a financial company, and you know, my buddy Joe was like, "Hey, you know, I can put you in touch with a member of the '98 Yankees." And I'm like, "Yeah, okay," you know, and I didn't pay any any mind to it. Then we get up there, and he's like, "Yeah, so you want to meet Todd?" And I had you know done some research. He wasn't Graham Lloyd or you know Mariano Rivera, but he was on the. 98 team he was a middle reliever and uh wound up talking with him and it was it was pretty crazy because i kept it at 15 minutes but i could have gone an hour you know i just had to harness all my excitement and try to keep it as professional as possible and not as uh not as haywire as i could have made it or as long as i could have made it because there were certainly a lot of questions that i wanted to ask but in the um you know in the spirit of what my teachers are requesting, I kept it around 15, 20 minutes. Was it a little nerve wracking? It was a little intimidating at first, but once I got into it, it was, uh, 
initially it was like, holy cow, uh, you know, great guy. Couldn't have been more accommodating. And, uh, you know, seeing the 98, I mean, he, he's like, here, try this on. It was the, the, the World Series ring. And it was just one of those teams that I followed, you know, listening on the radio. Uh, I was in high school. So, I mean, it was, uh, it was certainly a thrill. And uh, it turned out to be good. It's funny with podcasting or interviewing in general, especially when it's being recorded for people to listen to. Much like running, the first half mile is always the hardest. The launch is always the hardest. And then once you're five minutes in, you're just, you know, you're on cruise control. Just like when you're running, you get some of that buzz going and then you're just, you could go forever. But sometimes getting out of the gates is really the difficult part because your your mind is saying, how do I want to start this? How would a broadcaster start this? Do I go with prepared notes? Do I have do I have a couple of notes and then read off of them? And then you end up sort of in this nether world of of how you begin it. And then at the end of the day, the people listening don't even know what you were thinking in your mind anyway, and it all turns out fine. Yeah, Steve Harvey Steve Harvey says uh, jump. You know, you just got to go and do it. So uh, that's been a little bit <clears throat> in, in my thinking. Like, I have nothing to lose. No one really cares, so I'm going to go for it. I've... Uh, I've talked to chefs in Charlotte. I've been in the uh, the uh, air traffic control tower at Charlotte Douglas. Uh, I've been I've, I've done a lot of cool. I was on I was driving around the uh, NASCAR uh, speedway motor speedway. I mean, I've I've done a lot of cool things, and it's only going to get better, really. Um, and like you said, it's just you know getting started was initially my uh, you know my I guess hurdle. How have you done these? So you take a recorder with you and you just record it in the open or do you have do you have mics set up now? Yeah, it's so totally not podcast because in in, in the in the in, in like the uh, I guess in the proper terms because I don't have anybody although I did record one last week at school or two weeks ago at school in the studio and I will be recording one on Tuesday in the studio. But most of my um Pod, you know, podcasts have been unpodcast like, and like you said, I just bring a recorder, and uh, there are no individual mics or anything. So it is a little bit, uh, you know, I have to edit and and uh, make sure the audio volumes are okay. And I haven't done the best job at that, but uh, I'm learning. Like, uh, like that's why I'm at school. But um, yeah, it's uh, that's how I've been doing it. Do you feel yourself improving? Yeah, because there was one. Yeah, I think I think I am. I mean, I've got, you know, I've got no, I've got nowhere to go but up. Honestly, I mean, uh, it's just in formulating questions, when to interrupt, when not to interrupt, you know, when to answer. So how to go it's with the too- flow? How to how yeah. to get your questions in? It, it's it's sort of a it's like being a point guard. Yeah, and um, I think. I didn't want to, for instance, I had a guy that I'm, I'm editing a podcast right now. This guy, his name is Mike Reddington. He, he did a seminar at school, wound up speaking after the seminar. And I said, hey, you want to come on my podcast? We set a date. He was just a really cool guy. And I sent him the audio file of, uh, last week. And I said, what did you think? And he goes, man, you let me ramble on. But that was kind of, you know, I, I don't want to be, you know, I want to let the, uh, let the guest, you know, do most of the talking because that's what I've been doing so far. I think that'll change, but we'll see. Well, and I also think with something like that, it's caught between two worlds. Podcasting is very different than broadcasting. And I think at somewhere like CSB, they're teaching both, but ultimately they're probably teaching you to try to get into broadcasting. And I almost could not be in that because I would hate the fact of, even though that's where the money is, but I would hate being up against blocks. You know, this time is coming. I can only talk to Jeff Perlman for 14 minutes and 33 seconds because we can only put him in here. I want to let things breathe and go and just have a natural conversation. And so I think sometimes it's almost the the frame of reference of the person who's giving the critique um, is almost as important to know as, um, as the kind of medium you're going for. Uh, I think when you're sitting with somebody who's like, for instance, on the 98 Yankees and you're just sitting in, you were probably in his office, right? Yeah. Um, and you're just sitting there. I mean, it, you're not in a, you know, you're not in a $2 million studio <laughs> like with people talking in your ear. You kind of got to, you, you go with it. So I think they're good lessons to learn. It's good to understand the, um, the parameters of broadcasting and they help you keep things tight. 
But the thing I found with this is you just keep going. You keep doing as many as you can. If you try to do one a week, that's 52 a year. If you can sprinkle in a second one, all of a sudden they just they just build up in a mass. I mean, I just passed 200. You just keep going. And then before you know it, sort of like uh, playing basketball, playing anything, reading, you know, any of this, you become better at it sort of by default. I mean, you want to listen to it and get your lessons from it. Uh, you get your little ticks you do, which I'm sure you probably hear doing it. The certain things you do that you don't realize drive you nuts. And oh, I, don't yeah. even, I don't even want to say them out here because then it'll be on my mind for me. But Ruckers. <laughs> Ruckers. No, but, no, but see, even but... the way you answer, even the way when somebody answers a question and maybe the way that you transition from that question to your next one, if you listen to it, I mean, I do this, I probably say the same word it's terrible. transitioning it's... every time. And it's funny how that happens because in broadcasting, it's different. You're tight. You're on schedule. In podcasting, though, it sort of is just, it's free flowing. And I find myself doing that more with guests who are not my friends or people I have on regularly or who I know well, because you, you know, you got a little bit of, you got a little bit of nerves in you. You don't want to let them down being a guest on your show. And so you end up being a little bit like of a hyped up version of yourself. And that's when some of those things come out more. Yeah. And going back to your point, uh, or, uh, your point of, <clears throat> you know, set times and whatever, uh, and you know, that medium, um, that's going to be interesting moving forward because, uh, I'll just leave it at that. It's, uh, it's, it's certainly changing rather quickly and a lot of the industry is not adapting and, uh, it'll be, it'll be, it'll be a lot of fun going forward. I'll, I'll, leave, I'll that's what I have, you know, that's my thoughts on it. Well, and that's the beauty of just having your own thing because in the background you can be doing the thing the way you want to do it. And are you, is this your speaker? Do they set this up for you or? No, I did it myself. I mean, you know, there were a lot of, some of my, some of my classmates don't give a crap about uh, podcasting. They're more into the editing or they're into other aspects of, uh, <clears throat> of broadcasting. So no, this was done. Uh, I did this by myself. Awesome. All right. Well, let's segue into some college football. We talked about the fact we're really starting with the 28th, but um, on this day, the 17th, the start of bowl season, I will probably be checking in on certain bowls here and there. Are there any, as we look through from here through the 28th, that are particularly exciting? I would say probably today, Houston playing San Diego State is interesting because Houston yeah, has been, they've been a different team, obviously, the couple the last few years. Somehow they ended up with three losses, which was a problem. Probably one of the losses was because they knew their coach was leaving. Um, but Tom Herman is now the head coach of Texas. So I think we might see the vestiges of this Houston team. But uh, where does Houston go from here? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm not too sure. I mean, it's just, you know, it's Houston. I mean, not to put anything, you know, you know, I'm not trying to put them down. But like, because there was actual, actually like speculation of them going to the Big 12. But, or, you know, going to the, uh, you know, all these different conferences. I mean, there was speculation that BYU was going to the Big 12. So. I, I don't think I, th I want to say they'll just kind of like sit back in their seat and, and stay where they belong. And that's terrible to say, but I think that's what, where they're going to go. Cause that's where, what they are. I mean, they're a mid major college football team. They're not going to, you know what I mean? It, it's not, you know, Houston has to compete with so many f D one schools that are elite quote unquote in the state of Texas that, you know, Houston's probably just going to go to back to where they are, which is, you know, a mid level in a good school, but a football school, but, um, yeah, they play San Diego State today, and uh, great running back who's really small. I don't know if you've ever seen him play, but, like, he's so small, but he just gets yards, and uh, he's a senior, so that'll be a good game. But like you said, moving forward, I don't really think uh, – I, you know, I really don't think uh, anything – maybe the – yeah, I, I guess it's the Minnesota Washington State game. Will Minnesota play Washington State? Because I think Northern Illinois is in line to play Washington State if Minnesota doesn't play, and then you get to the twenty eighth. Um, but yeah, nothing too exciting. And I hate to be so cynical. I'm normally half a glass half full guy, but um, yeah, kind of a. I mean, Temple's playing Wake Forest, but uh, I don't know. Well, Temple, and that's another thing. So when we look at teams like Houston, we look at teams like Temple. Both of their head coaches went on to greener pastures. Um, well, it's funny, with, in the case of Baylor especially. Um, so I think when you, in, in a normal season, you would watch a bowl like this and say, 
How can this be a stepping stone to where they're going to continue to improve next year? But I think when they're in this kind of bowl, this might be their high watermark as opposed to the stepping stone towards something um, greater with the uncertainty of the two head coaches headed to two major Texas schools. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that uh, uh, the one thing I would say is good for Hawaii. The, you know, the, the one thing for this poor team who travels 50,000 miles this year, that at least they get to play at home <laughs> in the bowl. And uh, that's probably because of teams just not being able to afford to send uh, people there. And it just keeps keeps them there. Uh, I mean, Navy is 20, you know, number 25 in the in the nation, uh, it probably put quite a damper on it, losing to Army. <laughs> yeah, it's tough. Uh, but they, you know, they've been an interesting team. I mean, geez, uh, yeah, they they've been they've been pretty good. Twenty twenty five touchdowns from the from the Army uh, is Will Worth is the running back or the quarterback? Because you never know with these teams. Yeah, it's like uh, I think he's the quarterback, but I, <laughs> but 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 Navy. Um, yeah, he's the quarterback. Navy kick. Yeah. Ken Ken Niemal, I can't pronounce his name right now. But, oh yes, right. You know he'll use that he'll use that trip as a kind of a. Um, I don't know. I I mean I think he's a. Uh, I'm surprised he didn't leave. Actually, talking about that uh, coaching the coaching stuff, uh, the coaching carousel. Wasn't he I'm up surprised. for BYU or something? Yeah, he had opportunities and. Um, you know he didn't he didn't go, but so he decided to stay. And why why leave Navy? I mean you're pretty much the king of the independence. I mean if you're gonna compare, I mean it's kind of strange to think that you know if you, I haven't looked at the records, but I'm gonna go ahead and I'm just thinking about this now. But if I ever look at like the last eight years, and I know North Notre Dame played in the, in the national title game, and I know they played in other big bowl games, but like Navy might have a better overall record out of the independence when you you know Notre Dame BYU. I mean I don't know. It's uh it's in it's a good program he's built there, so why would he leave? Well, we brought up Temple at 24 playing Wake Forest. Do you have anything to say on Wakey Leaks? Yeah, I do. I just think what a strange, strange scenario. Basically, you know, the the uh, color guy, the radio analyst for Wake Forest, he was on the staff from 2001 to 2013, wasn't retained when Grove was fired uh, at the end of 2013, and went up to the booth and it's been alleged that since 2014, you know, and most of these broadcasters do have relationships with, you know, programs, coaches, what have you, but you know, it, it, he's been, I guess, giving it, it, the indications are that he's been kind of tipping other teams off on like what plays they're going to run, what, you know, what schemes are going to be doing in certain situations. So that's not a good look for, uh, for Wake Forest. But then I think, like, well, was he doing that intentionally because maybe he had, you know, maybe he had money? It, it, it's so ridiculous where this could wind up, and I'm going off the uh, off the ledge there with all these uh, spe- with all the speculation. But, well, the worrisome um, thing with a leak is that it does so much damage to everybody who's involved, and the more pervasive it gets and widespread it gets, you just start to go, oh my gosh. Weeks or leaks leaks show you, uh, you know that there are mice in the attic. They show you that there are bats in the attic, and you think nothing's going on up there, and then you hear little feet. <laughs> and so, the worst part of this is uh, when you see someone like Bobby Petrino come up in it, and you see people uh, looking for that edge wherever they can find it at any point in their career, and you wonder with this guy, it's like being a double agent. I mean, this is his program, and. Was he sad that he couldn't be coaching anymore, and this right, is going to be a, his way he was back? A player there, I mean, it was insane. I mean, he's definitely a Wake Forest guy. He bleeds the Demon Deacon, you know, or he drinks the Kool Aid. But it's just, it's, and I hate to be that guy, but like you got to think. Well, is it? Yeah, was he pissed? Is he doing this because of what had happened, or does he, you know the speculation can go all over the place? But the fact that this is even happening, it's just like it's really really crazy because you'd think that like if you knew this was happening if you're a school you'd probably want to keep that you know in-house and try not to let that get out but uh as i'm sure there are a lot of things that don't get out but uh strange story the uh boise state will be playing baylor isn't it crazy that it's been 10 years coming up on 10 years since the shocker uh where boise state beat oklahoma you know that's the best football college football game i've ever seen and it's funny you know we've talked about this you know, the best 
pro football game I've ever seen, or the most exciting, not best, most exciting college and pro football team uh, games have been played at University of Phoenix Stadium. But yeah, I remember <clears throat> that doesn't seem like that long ago, but yeah, it's 10 years. Incredible. And how much it's meant. I mean, you think about the fact that that was the head coach who's now the head coach of Washington, right? Yeah, Chris Peterson was there, and he, he you know, he had two undefeated seasons. Uh, you know, that impressive win against Oklahoma, especially after Zabransky throws the interception. You know, you just said game over, but you know they do the trick play, the hook and ladder, and then they go for two. I mean, it was just incredible. Um, I actually met a guy. I, I met a guy from Boise this week. He just moved out to Charlotte, and uh, he's like, "Yeah, you'd be surprised that like you know Boise State games aren't more rowdy." Now this guy. Uh, went to Oregon State. That's where he attended school. But uh, he li- he had lived in, in Boise for ten years. Just moved out here. But he made that comment, which I thought was interesting. Yeah, it was just a special moment. I mean, that team they had uh, Adrian Peterson on Oklahoma. They, they had Sam Bradford, right? Um, I, think. I don't think so. No, uh, but they they had, a- they had Adrian Peterson. Know. They definitely had him. I mean, we probably would have known more if if uh, Bradford were, th- were there, but. Um, you know, Stoops, big game, Bob coming up. You know, just spitting the bit again. It was just incredible. But wasn't wasn't the case surrounding it? Yeah, he was. And, he and there was, was there. there was actually a very uh, good article in not the newest Sports Illustrated because that's uh, LeBron James Sportsman of the Year, but in the previous one about this game and kind of an oral history type of deal. And from what I remember, it was like a secondary bowl, and Oklahoma was probably upset that they weren't in the big the big game yeah and so they, they kind of got snubbed yeah and they took it you know they weren't quite uh they might they might have, it. yeah they might have that's that's some of the some of the thought behind you know oklahoma's thinking and you know boise state doesn't have anything to lose but then well that was their time they were they were ascending to that game and oklahoma probably felt like they were descending to that game but oklahoma was still up in that game at the yeah, end and then they throw the yeah and zabransky throws the pick six they're up you know with all the moment after that interception that Zabransky threw the, you could just feel the momentum. It was like, ah, man, well, they gave it a shot, but then it was just the most exciting. It was incredible. And the wide receiver, I think through the, through a touchdown, uh, yep. which, which drove Zabransky nuts. Um, but yeah, v- very interesting. And then, uh, the player proposed to his wife. I mean, the whole thing <laughs> who was a cheerleader. I mean, you can't make it up. <laughs> the whole thing was, and I didn't realize this until reading this article, he went, uh, towards the stands to kind of celebrate with family ian johnson and i guess there were um temporary stands in place and the stands apparently fell or something and all these people fell on him (laughs) uh, from it was kind of a weird story my favorite part about the whole game was when when boise state won you know after they got the two points peterson does like a like a like a, a double fist pump and it was just like you, you know, no reaction the whole game, and you, you know he's probably going nuts, and he just gives. And I'll I'll try to find that clip and clip and send it to you later. But uh, yeah, yeah, that's uh, great. The the best, the best, the most exciting game I've seen. Uh, so now we're at the games we we're gonna truly talk about. Pittsburgh playing Northwestern. I didn't even realize that. Um, h- how did Pittsburgh beat Clemson? <laughs> They just ran the ball and they made a few stops. Deshaun actually just uh, Deshaun Watson fumbled. That was the big the big deal in my opinion. But Pittsburgh was running, you know, your option, but they with a wrinkle. So they kind of were put uh, Clemson's D a little bit off the toes. But basically, if Watson doesn't fumble there, Clemson wins. Clemson was waiting for a loss all year, though, weren't they? You know, I think and it's funny being down here. You get the there's a lot of there's a lot of Clemson fever here and. uh um, you either are or you aren't, and uh, I've heard a lot of well, Clemson's overrated all year from all the non-Clemson fans, but I've kind of felt that way pretty much my whole life. But not, that notwithstanding, um, yeah, this year I think you know they were probably hurt because you know they had a shot to beat Alabama, you know, and then Alabama with that onside kick kind of broke their heart. But uh, they could have beat Alabama last year, and maybe that I don't know, maybe that uh, took something away, but. You know, they came back poised, and you don't expect a Sean. They probably should be undefeated, um, a good game against Louisville. And uh, I, I don't know. Um, I, we'll see what happens. Um, but Pittsburgh, I like Pittsburgh in this matchup. They're, uh, they're running back, came back from cancer. He's run the ball all over the place. Uh, you know, I think Pittsburgh's good. I like Pittsburgh in this matchup. Did you, <clears throat> did you see that, that sport? It was a Sports Illustrator or, no, Disney thing where now, he was you, would, offered. Would you? 
the uh, well, or where he was given the uh, award for perseverance or something. Um, yeah, that was pretty. That was pretty Connor. touching. Yeah, that was yeah. pretty good. Now, would you go to the pinstripe ball? When I get towards this time of year, I just don't want to be in the cold. Um, it's just not. They give you a box, no? I, I guess I, if I were given a box, sure. I mean, I'll take a box. Cool. I, I, I'd kind of want to see a game at Fenway or Yankee. I don't know. I, I kind of want to do that, even though it's probably underwhelming. But yeah, well, I mean, it's fun. It's fun being there. I, it is funny though how much like how silly it is where we go. Oh my God! There's going to be a football game at Yankee Stadium, and in like the 50s and 60s, it was sort of like, oh no, we have nowhere for these teams to play. Let's stick them in Yankee Stadium. Let's stick them in Shea Stadium. I mean, when you think about the fact how O.J. Simpson had his 2,000 yard season and he passed the mark, and that was at Shea Stadium uh, against the uh, the Jets, from what I what I remember. Um, but now it's like we have these beautiful stadiums, and people just forget that they played in in these kind of stadiums before. And there are still some teams in the league, such as Oakland who play in the dual stadiums. But now it's like, Ooh, the pinstripe ball and it's all marketing and it's trying to get people in and to pay more. But it is, yeah, it is, it's... you know, it is fun. It looks silly though, when they pull back, and, you know, above the stadium and there's just these huge swaths of area that doesn't look, look right. But the, the hockey is interesting to me because it's outdoors. Well, um, it's a little bit more, more entertaining, I think. Yeah. More natural, I think. Does that make Yeah, I think that's sense. fun. We're used to football being outside. So when hockey, which is an outdoor sport for kids growing up in a lot of ways, when they get to play outside, that's that's really fun. Although the luster's come off of that too over time because you see it enough and it's sort of not as special. I don't even know if the – was it HBO that would do the – like the behind the story leading up to those games? I don't even know if they yeah. do those um, anymore. I think – I don't – I'm not sure. Yeah. West Virginia, Miami, anything? Uh, I like West Virginia. I think of, this is West Virginia game. West Virginia's game to lose, um, kind of to maybe solidify the Big Twelve. Kind of a down year for the Big Twelve. Um, I mean, essentially a home game for Miami, but their fans never travel. So uh, I think it's West Virginia's game to to lose. And I think they want to. I think they want to get to eleven wins. So uh, I ha- like uh, the Mountaineers. Has Mark Richt been um, a market improvement for Miami in his first year? I mean, I think he has to be. Um, they, you know, they might. They probably might be nine and three. Uh, uh, eight and four. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, they, should they should be, be nine, nine and three. three right. In my opinion, at least. Yeah, it's an improvement. And then, you know, unfortunately, you won't see, you know, his players for another year or two. But I mean, what he did up at Georgia, I mean, was pretty solid. So he'll get. He'll get. Uh, he'll get some time to do what he needs to do down in Miami, and hopefully turn it. You know, you know, revitalize that program. And a place like Georgia might have uh, lost out on a good coach because they're not who they think they are. You know, they're they're not who they're supposed to be. Which, uh, when you have Alabama in that in that uh, division, you're just kind of in a perpetual state of never reaching that that uh, ceiling. And sometimes these teams make moves that really set them back because they're not comfortable in who they are. And let's be honest. If Saban were ever to retire or leave for something else, whether it's for broadcasting or the NFL, like you might have been better off maintaining who you were because he's such a shooting star, what he's built, that that program would potentially go on for a couple more years with um, with what he was able to build. But at some point, uh, the likelihood is that things will regress back to what um, maybe your program is supposed to be. And then you end up taking shots with people who are from his uh, coaching tree and you go kind of backwards which Georgia kind of did this year yeah I didn't really see it um, I think speaking of the coaching tree I think Mac McElwain's the coach in that division I mean their defense is solid Georgia just for some reason I I don't know why they can't get the big win I mean, the SEC East isn't that quote-unquote it's the lesser of the it's not the SEC West but Florida is the team to beat in that uh, once again they're the team to beat in the east uh south carolina vanderbilt tennessee i mean tennessee was a little bit a little bit on the uh, well in the first four weeks or whatever oh tennessee all this hype but uh they didn't really do anything and i agree with what you said about georgia it's like uh it's kind of like clemson clemson what clemson east or whatever it's they're always in the shadows yeah, they always they always feel like, insignificant as to who they they, they shoot like that, they shoot for home runs and then you strike out. Yeah, as opposed to uh, keeping the keeping the rally going. Yeah, I mean it, it's it's weird because 
Um, a lot of Georgia, I mean, Georgia football, a lot of the schools down south, their Saturdays are really serious. It's, it's an event to go to a college game. And uh, I know a bunch of Georgia fans personally, and they're not too thrilled with, uh, you know, with the program in general. So we'll see what happens. <clears throat> Next up, we have Indiana, Utah. Utah looks like it had another season where they kind of were who they normally are, somewhere in the teens, ranking three, four losses. Uh, yeah. And Indiana, another just a 500 season where they show and the promise gone. and the coach is gone, and Indiana is sort of Indiana in football. Yeah, you got, you got to go with Utah here. I mean, <clears throat> they're, they're, that's another t- – I mean, USC probably should have beat them. But uh, and Utah yeah, was like really Utah. Uh, close with Washington in their game, right? And it took a um, a punt return at the very end of the game, from what I remember. Yeah, it was wild. Pettis. It was yep. It was a wild game. It was really close up in Salt Lake, and uh, yeah, Utah's solid. I mean, Whittingham always has those guys playing good, and um, you know, I think he's staying in Salt Lake. I don't think there's been rumors, but uh, he'll be staying there. Yeah, it's one of those places where if you're program is okay with being very good to excellent but not elite then it's a good match for everybody i mean utah um obviously urban meyer was there (laughs) and took them to to high places but he wasn't going to stay there for long so you kind of it's like you know it's like having a stock that's going to do really quite well every year but it's not going to be a blue chip where you make like a million dollars off of off of a hundred dollar investment um Texas A&M at Kansas State. Texas A&M had all promise as as they tend to. They were like 6 and 0 and they were really flying high and they were kind of brought back to earth. I think they lost four of their last six. I like I like Texas A&M in this game just because of the the talent standpoint, but I mean, what is Bill Snyder doing? The guy just is an incredible coach. I mean, <clears throat> it's just fascinating to me how he, I mean, you can say, well, there's more games, but yeah, I mean, eight and four is eight and four. You know, it's not six and six. I mean, it's just, uh, I don't know how Kansas State does it. I mean, they kind of play ugly, but they get their guys to believe in the system. But I still like Texas A&M. 77 years old. Wow. It's, and he retired. He came back. It's just what? <laughs> it's unbelievable. Ron Prince came in, and then he took over for him. It's just, yeah, the stadium's named after him. I mean, South Florida, South Carolina, anything? You know what? This is an interesting game because um, with the coaching change at South Florida uh, and you got South Carolina, that, and that's 6-6 six and six for Gamecocks is kind of misleading. Uh, I just don't think they're like, you know, you know when you read like 6-6 six and six and you're like, oh, that's like, okay, they're 500. This year to me, South Carolina 6-6 six and six really feels like, like a – I don't know, like a five and seven, like it just, it doesn't seem, they don't, they don't, I, I like South Florida in this game, but you know, you can't be surprised if South Carolina wins because it's the SEC, but once again, down year for the SEC this year uh, with the Alabama exception. <clears throat> Arkansas, Virginia Tech, Virginia Tech gave a run to, um, uh, it was Clemson, right? Yeah. And, and Virginia Tech is, uh, the coach, the coach from Memphis, was up there. Uh, he he started over for Beamer. This was his first year. Fuentes and uh, yeah, Fuentes and and Arkansas. Just they like for years now under Bielema, they just can't seem to get out of their own way, and not physically because they do have the biggest once again uh, offensive line in the country. But they just you know they play in the, they're tough. You don't know what you're going to get from them. It's so strange. They're seven and five, but like in my eyes, easily could be. 10 and 2, uh, 9 and 3, but he's kind of um, turned them into an SEC Wisconsin. And I might be yeah, exactly. And I might be going to this game. Um I might be going to this game or I'm going to go see that uh Zion uh the the top junior. Uh he plays down the road in Spark- Spartanburg for the basketball player. I'll send you the link later. Kid's crazy. He had the number one uh top play on Sports Center last night. I saw that at the bowling alley, but um yeah, the, Arkansas is kind of like yeah, they've morphed into that Wisconsin type. I mean, it's just a straight. They're in games, but then they'll lose. It, it, they're a strain. I can't ever figure them out. There's something tugging them to seven and five. Both if they're under it, they can play high level to get up there, and if they're over it, they're falling back. It's hard in that. I mean, it's it's sort of hard to be a very good team in a conference like that. But um, 
What is uh what is Belk? Oh, it's a department store. Department store. Second Macy's, JC Penny. So you went bowling in South Carolina? Yeah, last night I went bowling. I was at the Lake Wiley Bowl and Bounce where What's the scene? I, like what's the South Carolina bowling scene like? I mean, is it It's a like brand going, new alley. Oh, so, so it's, it's not like, it's not old school like going back in time to the 70s. No. Whereas like if you go down the road 5 miles, 10 miles, 15, 20 miles, every any everything west of me is is like what you described. It's kind of uh a little bit, you know, behind the times. But, uh, yeah, bowling alley was fun last night. Uh, after 10.45 or after 11, you, you, $10 unlimited bowling. So me and my buddies were bowling for, bowling for dollars. I won a bet, so it was good. Do it you was ever... funny. Last, last oh, week ahead. I went – sorry. Last week I went to bowling, and I played five, four or five games. Couldn't couldn't break 100. And then – Every game I played this this week or last night, excuse me, a few hours ago, I, I broke a hundred, so it was nice. Do you ever step out of like your area and go, "Ooh, what have I walked into? I don't feel that safe right now." Yeah, from time <laughs> to time, there'll be some, and I'll do that intentionally too, uh, just to see kind of I don't know, cause I'm strange, but uh, not really all the time. But I've done that a few times, and uh, yeah, it's it's definitely, I mean. It's it's definitely different, man. I, it's hard to describe. I kind of like it. I kind of don't, but it is what it is. It's just it's strange. It's very Trump country at this point. What is the what is the scene like now that he's president elect? Like, I'm interested in this aspect because I was obviously not for him in any way, but when he's become the president elect, he's sort of doing a lot of things that are maybe not what he said he would do, which might align more they might find their way aligning more with the way I actually kind of agree with things are people down there, maybe who voted for him. Are they seeing this stuff happening? Are they sort of not paying attention? Cause it's like a super bowl and they got their team in and they move on. Like how are people assessing this, uh, in this period of time since the election happened? Well, it's a great question. Um, because I live right on the border. So, you know, three, four miles down the road, I'm in Charlotte. Charlotte is a huge, Charlotte's borders are strange, but it's a big town, but Charlotte encompasses a lot. <clears throat> so if you go into Charlotte, especially if you go uptown um, to like where, uh, you know, uh, the, the bars and stuff are, you know, the trendy bars, the yuppie bar, they're building apartments left and right. It's, Charlotte is continuing to grow. It's crazy. I think most of the, most of the farm, it, it's really an ideal, an ideology, really, I think. I mean, <laughs> He's going to um, Charlotte, and I have some friends that are, uh, you know, a little bit more left leaning, if you will. I mean, I, I really couldn't care less. It's all it's all a, a joke. The only thing that matters are local elections, but whatever. Um, but the I the the thinking is is you know, I go ten, I go two miles, I go a mile down the road, and there's farms. Okay, so their thinking is different than you know suburbia. And I even felt some of the because we live in a development here, and you get and they're building development after development. It's just the way it is. And these people are saying all these northerners and all these people from out of state are moving in. Well, don't sell your land because the people that are owning the land are making a killing off the you know the sale. Um, but in the city, where it's kind of you know being it, it, it's growing, it's hip, it's it's chic, uh, it's so much growth. You'll find that, uh, especially with the uh, the bill, the bathroom bill, like they're not. I mean, Mecklenburg County, which is where Charlotte is, they they were blue. Um, so, uh, but then you know, I'm right over the border, and it's farmland, and it's it's just a different way of thinking, man. It's all that's all it is, you know. That's all it is. But do you do you sense people are noticing, like the micro movements that he's doing, and and actually sort of pulling back from some of the things that. Maybe they went to these rallies and were shouting. <laughs> um, do you sense well, I mean, that people idea, care, yeah. or is it early? Still too early. And I think it might be too early. But I mean, let's be honest. The idea that you're going to really build a wall. I mean, get the heck out of here. That's never going to happen. Who, in their right mind, legitimately thinks they're going to build a wall? Like seriously. And I'm not even trying to be cynical there. I'm like, that to me is a. I mean, I don't think you can do that. Um, but I think it's too early. 
quickly to tell, I think. But there's also a rivalry between like South Carolina and North Carolina with the natives. But yet I don't really meet many natives because everyone's from out of state. That's but true. The few, but the few, but the few, um, the few natives I, I've met, uh, um, it, it's just a different way of thinking, you know. And a lot of these people are like, you know, a lot of these these Southerners are like, you know, it's not. It was never about slate. It was about states' rights, and that's what. You know, they teach it. It was about slavery. It wasn't about slavery. It was about states' rights. And it's just so funny how people are going to believe what they want to believe. But, uh, you know, and it, I haven't seen it yet to answer your question. I know that was a, uh, a oh, rigmarole. Right. No, it's been – it's it's fascinating because, like, I've – I read this stuff all the time, whether it was the election, before the election. I just constantly read this stuff. And so um, I don't think a lot of people are maybe constantly – reading as many sources as they can, or they're focusing on maybe outlets that cater to how they think. And it, 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 we're living in a time where it's just like, what's up, what's down, what's left, what's right. It's very, very hard to, uh, it's very hard to assess what reality is because any of our realities are just could be, uh, based on a lot of bias. Um, but, uh, I was just interested in that Oklahoma state, Colorado, Colorado's, uh, had a really good season and, their head coach is sort of in talks for maybe uh, a fringe uh, coach of the year type deal, right? Yeah, and I don't know. Lou Fow might be out again. I don't know what his injury status is for the uh, Alamo Bowl, but uh, you got to think Oklahoma State is just going to be flying all around. No weather conditions to uh, affect how they run their offense, which is, you know, I mean, their quarterback actually is from South Carolina. It's right down the road in Rock Hill, and uh, they throw almost like 70, 80 times a game. Gundy throws the ball like it's crazy. but And I've been hearing all this stuff about Colorado defense, which is good, but I like Oklahoma State in this game. Uh, next up, we have Georgia versus TCU, 7-5 and five versus 6-6. Six and six. I'm going to uh, be steadfast. Is that a descriptive word? I'm going to be adamant, excuse me. Uh, and I could be proven wrong, um, but I like TCU in this game. I think Gary Patterson's is just a better coach. I'm going to go to coach here, and uh, I don't know. We'll see how uh, see how they. I mean, it's it's. My question is, if you're playing these like whatever auto zone balls, like if you're a player, like yeah, you you should be motivated. You should never not be motivated. Like it should be implied that that's your job because that's what you're going to school for, basically football, but. Um, I don't know. I, I think TCU wins this game. And scouts are watching. You know, I mean, it's a big, it's a big moment to play uh, another good team. You know, it's one game after you haven't played in like a month. So I'm just, I just look back to that USC Sun Bowl a few years ago where we just spit the bit. I don't know. I just and Lane's on the sideline, just not giving a crap. And actually, Lane wasn't there. It was quite helpful. But anyway, yeah, uh, no, whatever. It's not easy. The next game is it's a pretty good one. Uh, Stanford, number eighteen, they do have three losses. They got bludgeoned by uh, Washington, and uh, I think there was there were many more hopes for Stanford this year, and they sort of regressed right to where they are, which is a good good team. They have to uh, they have to recruit a little differently because it is Stanford. Um, they obviously have Christian McCaffrey, uh, who's who had a really good season, but. It didn't feel as uh, meteoric as last year. Maybe that's because last year was, was so good. Start. And it was a slow start too. Yeah, a slow start too. And he's play. They're playing against North Carolina. I know North Carolina kind of surprised last year. I didn't see a lot of them this year. Are they? I think they had more wins and less losses last year. But they're they're eight and four. This should be a pretty good game though. Yeah, I mean, I gotta think that David Shaw is gonna somehow figure out something to to win this game and uh, i'm gonna go with stanford next up we have nebraska at number 21 tennessee i know people from tennessee um who are fans and like any fan base they seem to hate their coach um and don't love their quarterback where is tennessee they (laughs) even the games they won i feel like they were down big as well yeah tennessee is strange i i actually would tend to agree with the uh, the fan base. Um, I think they probably need, you know, it's so screwed up. Lane Kiffin kind of screwed them over. I mean, they kind of, 
I mean, going back to him, and then uh, they have now Jones. I I, I don't like him um, either, but uh, Tennessee probably is going to win this game. Uh, Nebraska is so uh, Nebraska is just so. I don't I don't get them. Uh, they should they're tough, but um, aren't these teams like, very similar when you think about it? Not even I don't mean this year, but just general, uh, yeah. legacy Program, wise. Yeah. Like you look at they had their day, and they're sort of. They're fighting to be relevant, and they're always kind of chasing history. And can they be? And they've tried. They've tried to bring in people, but can they be what they what they were? <laughs> yeah, I mean, and Tennessee probably should have lost to Appalachian State. Let's just That's be right. clear about that. <laughs> just be very clear about that. They didn't, but um, yeah, Nebraska probably the greatest greatest team I think I saw. Like I, I looked at the ninety five Cornhuskers. Look at the look at their schedule and look at the scores. It was incredible, and they beat Florida in the title game, like sixty two twenty four or whatever. With the anyway, option, then, yeah, Tommy Frazier, and then they had so they had ninety five, and they had co national title in ninety six with Michigan, or was that ninety seven? I yeah, Florida won in ninety six, but you know Tennessee won in ninety eight. I mean, so these teams, these programs are like twenty years removed from like a national title, and so they've done it. Uh, I just it's it's strange because you know Tennessee's got Neyland State. Tennessee's a huge fan base. It's not like they don't have the support, but you know you're getting in scandals and and this. It, yeah, I, if I was a Tennessee fan, I'd like to see a, a new coach too. They're kind of like me. yeah, they're kind of like, like those them. cities. Like they're kind of like those cities that had like like Pittsburgh that had the steel boom, and they were enormous cities. So the infrastructure built up to accommodate that, and then when the bust happens, you still have that size city standing, and things deteriorate. And ultimately, you have a real uh, downtrodden society so around it. And then you so need you're things. At, you're looking at Scranton. Y- yeah. And then what happens is uh, Pittsburgh found a way, meds and eds, med, you know, um, focus on uh, medicine, hospitals, and ed education. And they find a way to rebuild themselves in a different light. And I think for programs like this, they need to kind of do the same thing. They need to get out of the shadow of their history and find out what their new future will be. Not saying nine and three and eight and four are terrible, but I think when you're at this level of football, three or four wins is a sort of a death sentence for a season. But that's my question to you. I mean, when did? I mean, it's just so interesting because it's not like Nebraska and Tennessee aren't bad programs. It's not like Stanford or USC or you know, it's not like LSU is a bad program. But like these expectations that the fan bases have, it's just a, it's it's just another business, and it's just. And there's too many it's, it's, competitors. It's there's exactly. too many competitors so, for for everybody to be who they want to be. And that's why I don't like all. Well, whatever. I, it's not for me to decide. But let's be serious. I mean, when you're, you know, I, I like the ideas of bowls. It gives the you know opportunity to showcase the kids, and you know they play in another game. But oh, I never thought I'd say that I wasn't a fan of all these bowls, but. This year in particular, I just, I, I you know. It feels like a bubble are, bursting a little bit. Yeah, it is. But maybe that's because Alabama is going to win no matter what. I don't know. And we have Air Force playing my favorite, USA, uh, South Alabama. I don't even know what to say about this other than I just like to say USA, USA. You know, it's funny. My friend Tyler, fellow classmate, at uh, he's from Coleman, Alabama. And it's around, right, it's around Birmingham. Uh yeah, it's uh, it's funny. Alabama is just funny, and uh, I know I know USA has got that quarterback again, but uh, Air Force up year. Uh, I go with the uh, <clears throat> I go with the Falcons. And then here's where the games start to get fun. This is a great game. Number six Michigan against number eleven Florida State. It really is. This is a great game. There are going to be NFL players littered across the field here. And they're not playing for one of the major bowls. They're on the outside looking in um, by their Who own. Who do you like? Uh, I, I, I would say, say Michigan, but it, I don't I know. Like, I actually kind of like Florida Have State. Have you been watching the season with uh, Florida State this year? I haven't. Once they got it's, destroyed it's by crazy. Louisville, I was sort of like, uh, I don't know about this. Why? What are you What are you seeing in the show? It's just – it's just – uh, uh, Jimbo is just an interesting guy. I'll I'll say that, and uh, I, it was really a lot of fun to watch. And yeah, they started out slow, you know, losing, getting they they, they got crushed to Louisville. They, they got pummeled, and uh, yeah, they got talent and stuff. 
But then I, I, I have to think that Michigan's probably going to win. You have to, right? Yeah, I, I just really like this game because I'm not 100% sure. This is one Phys- of those games. It's like, phys- it's like physical versus athletes. Who's going to win? There's kind of a part of me that kind of likes this game in the same way uh, I like Alabama-Washington. It's a clash of cultures, and you don't know which which culture is, right. is, is miles ahead of the other. Now, obviously, Alabama is in that one, but – but you're not a hundred percent sure sometimes, like what could happen, especially when you have a full month. This one, I don't know because I don't, I don't love Michigan's quarterback, and I think their defense is great. I think Peppers is a, ph- a phenom. Obviously, he's from New Jersey too. Um, but I, I, I just don't know because there is there is some electricity with Florida State that I think in in some regards Michigan doesn't have. I think Florida State's quarterback. This could almost be one of those games that help launch Francois, Francois yeah. into the you know next level where they look back at this game and go oh that was where he really you know he really found it they have an NFL running back in Dalvin Cook he's been a running back for a couple of years um I'm this is a really great game I mean if this were uh if if both of these teams had one less loss they would potentially be in the running um, especially Florida State missing out on the or if they didn't have that Louisville smudge. That was a ooh, that's a brutal one. Who was uh and the Michigan Ohio State game was the best football game of the year. Um but who was uh who was Michigan's other loss this year? Oh they they, they played uh holy cow. Let's see. Oh, I can blow it up here. This is terrible. I'm just because they started some... out really well. They lost to Iowa fourteen thirteen. <clears throat> yeah, they were on the road there and they it's like one of those wins. Like, Iowa had a great year last year, but, like... And then lost to North Dakota State this year. Yeah, and they lost last night at home, North Dakota State, by the way, to uh, James, J- James Madison. But, um, yeah, it's uh, it's one of those games where this is a great game. I mean, the records don't indicate, I think, the level of talent. And, you know, like you said, I mean, you, you know, Michigan probably could be, you know, 12-0. and They're that close to being 12-0. and they really are, and and those are the kind of things that worry me. Uh, losing 14-13, uh, just beating Wisconsin 14-7, and uh, I, when I look up and down the schedule, I don't see somebody Michigan played who has electricity to this level because Ohio State, as much as they have the remnants of, of really great offensive players, they're a little broken offensively. And yeah, even in the Michigan, too. Yeah, yeah, and even in the Michigan game, they they needed like – really bad turnovers from Michigan to be really deep in their uh in their zone to get their to get their touchdowns and plays. They really they squeak that out. So this is one of those deals where if Florida State were to kill Michigan, it might make us go, uh oh <laughs> for for Ohio State um, you know, down the road. Like it's one of those this could be one of those that help us maybe see where we're going uh as we head towards the bigger bowls, especially the top four. I don't know. I just a month with Urban Meyer is dangerous. He he's a, he's a master. No, I, I yeah no, I agree with that. So, but this is a this is like a great game. The next one, LSU Louisville is really fun. I uh, you obviously have Lamar Jackson who won the Heisman. Um, Fournette. Yeah, Fournette. LSU seven and four. LSU lost to Wisconsin. They they are down. They could beat Louisville though because Louisville outside of Jackson. Is not quite. I mean, just look amazing. at the. I'm and I'm and I hate to do this, but I mean, I'm a Coach O fan, and like Bobby Petrino is just once again. I mean, I'm not saying anything new, but LSU might win this game. I think LSU has a lot more to play for. I mean, <clears throat> they're probably excited too that they know that Coach O is their their guy. You know, moving forward, um, Petrino might not make it to December 30th, you know, he might be out before the game go. And I'm being serious about that. You know, you never know. What do you guy. mean? Where will, where would he go? I'm just saying, who knows the guys that so look at his, look at his resume, man. It's just incredible. The amount he, he's just not, he's not accountable. I don't think. Well, he's on. Dr- so, yeah. There's always something like in the sense that if he were to leave immediately, it means that this team, which I think he went all in on to try to get them to the next level. And they were very close. But very close. Um, this team, I mean, losing like to Houston Louisville. was awful. But that like if Lu- they won that Clemson yeah. game, it might have changed. It might exactly. have changed things. And 
he could then carry that and get to that high. He needs to get back to that national championship. He needs to get to that, or not back. He needs to get to that national championship level. And to, uh, if he leaves, yeah. it, if it le- if he leaves, it means oh my god, investigators get in there and look, <laughs> look behind the uh, curtains because some crazy it's, stuff happened. You know, when I look at Houston, Florida State, and Louisville's nine and three, uh, and it's just like. Man, Louisville's nine and three. I think Louisville's nine and three might be better than Florida State's nine and three. I, I, I know, in fact, that. But but then Louisville's losses were bad, though. But it's just crazy because you know I was at that Clemson game and they almost you know they might have. I it's just they were that close and I couldn't agree with you more with that uh, little little with with your points there, man. No, it's pretty unbelievable, and I think also we saw the beauty of sports this year in the sense when we had our first preview podcast on this, we go. Boy, this is the one year where we know all the Heisman candidates. We know who's going to win the Heisman because we had all the guys back. We had Watson. We had McCaffrey. I mean, we had Cook. We had Peppers who was in there who was going to be discussed. And we went, boy, this is as open and shut as it's ever happened. And the beauty of sports is the unknown. And, I mean, you were talking about Lamar Jackson, but we didn't know about like this, <laughs> like w- the way he kicked the season off where he's putting up eight touchdowns in games and for someone to ascend and win it when I think there was still some doubt with how they ended things and the offensive uh, prolificness uh, kind of fell off a, a little bit, uh, which can happen. I mean, we saw the magic of somebody who just ascended in one season and just took the mantle. Yeah, it was it was crazy. It was it was really crazy, and you no, know, not a big guy, but he, he's pretty accurate with his uh, with his arm too, which is even more impressive because I think that gets overlooked because he's you know he's you know cutting and he's moving around the pocket, but I think he's got a great he's a great talent. Is there anything for Georgia Tech and Kentucky? Uh, I don't really, you know, I probably uh, see Kentucky winning that game, but. Georgia Tech, we're on that option. You never know what you're going to get. But I like Kentucky this year. They they, they put a good year. The Tech together. Slayer Bowl. And now we reach the big boys. I thought they no, were I... moving these away. Um, there are some games right after, but why have they moved these? Why have they not moved them from uh, New Year's Eve? I thought that was happening, or is that in the future? It's in the future. What? Now, why are, you, why are you liking Washington here? I'm going to be that I, guy. I'm not. Um, I, I don't. I think that they potentially will get slaughtered. But, and here's the deal. I did not really watch Washington this year because they're on the West Coast. You're a USC fan, so it makes you really watch the Pac-12 and especially watch who the teams that are, you know, in your way. You beat you beat Washington um, in, in Seattle. Uh, USC got destroyed by Alabama. Now, that was a different Alabama team. I mean, that was a different USC team they became a different team with the new quarterback um, <clears throat> and found themselves a bit. So I don't know really how to do the comparisons there, but I can tell you straight up, Alabama destroyed and then Washington got beat pretty good um, by them. But when I went back and I went game for game uh, with the walkthroughs and the highlights and all that, and you can really be skewed in highlights, but I will say Washington has a lot of weapons. Um, they have uh, They have Ross. They have Pettis. Pettis. Yeah, they, they have quarter, um, the running backs pretty the, good. Yeah, not sold on the quarterback. Not a huge fan, but uh, now why aren't you sold on him? <clears throat> because, in my opinion, you got to beat USC at home. You know, and I just didn't see. I mean, USC. Like, I mean, USC isn't. I didn't think USC's defense. I mean, I almost swore. USC. Their front four was much maligned <laughs> their front four was not that good injuries left and right same thing with the linebackers too our secondary was okay um i, I just don't understand why uh, i just didn't understand the offensive philosophy that they were doing against the trojans uh and i think i think i, w- I wasn't sold on the quarterback i don't think i don't think their offensive game plan was as good as it could have been and i i know that's you know easy to say, but I just really thought they attacked USC. So, so when I look at that and I say, well, then how that, and they, how are they going to attack, you know, Alabama? Well, how does anybody attack Alabama? Maybe Peterson's got something up his sleeve, but that was what I'm going to say. Does he pull back his old, does he play as if he is Boise state in this game? 
does he I mean, bring he in has to. does he bring in hook and ladders the statue does he bring in magical hidden plays because they might be that much of an underdog i don't see the line here but they, what are they they were maybe 14 point right or 11 point favorites alabama i think it was yeah, something it's, crazy it's like a, that it's a two uh it's it's just one of those things where <clears throat> Plus, they have to come to the west. They have to come to the East Coast, being a West Coast team. They're playing 12 p.m. their time. Yes. Uh, Alabama again barely has to got, travel. <laughs> ever, again, it's incredible. I have them at you know. I'm looking at two different places here, and uh, the one place I have it is at 15 and a half, and now I've got it down to uh, 14. So it's it's going all over the place, but it's two touchdowns solid, you know, not, nothing under 14 that I see. And, and the Pac-12 was down this year in a way, right? Yeah, surprisingly. Yeah, I mean, to think that, like, Alabama's toughest to – well, I don't know. It, yeah, the Pac-12 was uh, not good, man. I mean, seriously, after USC, yeah, it did, Oregon was down, Stanford was down. You know, UCLA. Washington, Colorado. Yeah, what, yeah, exactly. Rosen go, goes out. Arizona, terrible. Sanu, uh, Solomon's transferring, by the way, the quarterback. Oh. Two years removed from the Pac-12 title game. Now he's going somewhere else. He was injured all all uh, all year. But, you know, uh, yeah, down year, down year, down well, year. And how about the fact that if you look at Washington, they really could be a uh, a three-loss team. They like, like we talked with Utah, they were tied with Utah at the very end of the fourth quarter and needed a punt return touchdown from Pettis to win that game. The Arizona game, which you noted, they, overtime, they yeah. went to overtime. They, they only game. just won. It so was, it was, yeah. yeah. I mean, they destroyed pretty much everyone else uh, in every game that they, uh, but then look at their the non-conference. But look, yeah, but yeah, exactly. But like, then look at their non-conference. I mean, I mean, I, Rucker, I that Rutgers game solidified my my expectations <clears throat> in Washington. <laughs> just, uh, Rutgers had one of the worst seasons, I think, in the history of college major college football. Um, but in terms of like oof. story, but in tor- terms of like storylines, uh, you know, kudos, you know, tip the ca- tip of the cap to uh, Peterson for you know this is fourth year. Yeah. You know, that's pretty. That's got to be cool. You know. Because why would you leave Boise? You know why? You know, I, it, and so it's kind of cool to see him do this. Move to the next uh, stage and grasp it. Yeah, yeah, and and you know actually do something with it. How was Jake but, Browning? Uh, how was he not at the Heisman? Uh, like, how was he not a finalist? Because I think there was a well, it's East Coast bias, man. No, I think. But um, those numbers, forty-two touchdowns. Yeah, thirty-two eighty play? yards. Who did they play? Yeah, Pac-12. but it's the Pac twelve league. Yeah, but they're Look in the league. But they're in the final four. <laughs> I, I mean, that was a shock to me that he wasn't in it. I'm not saying he should win it, but for two players from Oklahoma to get in, and well, for him not I to be in. Well, no, you you make a good point, and that goes to show that there's probably a lot that you know I can't. I don't understand. I just don't understand it. But I'm not out there saying that he. If you're going to tell me Jake Browning should have been invited been fine but i mean I, I don't know i mean he he had a first you know his first eight games were pretty good but then you know he didn't show me anything against usc in a game that they had to win at home national tv uh you know sailgate all this stuff and 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 they they stunk it up but i i would counter by saying that um lamar jackson as prolific as he was he had a couple of uh he had a couple of games where um, where, Clunkers, where, yeah. where their score wasn't um, clunkers. Yeah, it here, wasn't phenomenal. Then, yeah, but 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 uh, we're talking about Heisman, like the best college player, right? Like, I mean, I think that's what we're talking about. I, I, I don't know. Then then we're getting into interpretations. But I mean, Browning's got weapons. Yeah, Lamar I'm not Jackson asking him to win. I'm not. I'm not asking him to uh, to win it. I'm just shocked he wasn't. I'm just shocked he wasn't there. I mean, with yeah, the players you're that have were two sent, guys from Oklahoma, yeah, two guys from Oklahoma. I mean, and look, Jabril Peppers is great, but this guy threw this, thing this guy out. threw you know, forty two touchdowns. Ke- you know, Keenan Reynolds wasn't invited last year. The guy from Navy. So, I mean, to figure to even begin to understand the you know the Heisman, the the, the uh, whatever you want to call it, the. Uh, the offices at the Heisman or the foundation or the club. It's just bizarre. And they have him here. I was looking at um, at Lamar Jackson. 
They have 30 touchdowns here, but I can't tell if that's just, yeah, those are passing touchdowns. So I hate this. Why aren't they giving me the total? How many total touchdowns did he end up with? If he has, if he has it's like 30 it's passing, like... Uh, why aren't these stats good? And I see a rushing to, yeah, I mean, he's got a million here. <laughs> 8, 10, 12, 14, 15, like, 16, to... 19, 21, plus 30. So he's got 51 total touchdowns. I'm just in, I was in shock because I didn't know I knew I knew who Browning was, um, but I didn't know till I was really like getting into the film and watching the games. I mean that is a prolific season, and I'm sorry if if a team is in the final four and you're t- like they're trying to tell me that uh, a three loss Louisville team with a player who has 12 less passing touchdowns. Yes, he has uh, 51 total, but uh, 12 less passing touchdowns. Uh, that if that that the three losses for Lamar Jackson um, are, are are enough for him to win, but losing one clunker to USC, where when I was looking at it, they were still within a touchdown, I think, in the fourth quarter, right? Yeah, they had kept it close. Yeah, I was just, I mean, I'm it standing, was ugly, yeah, but... I'm standing on the you know the thing here. I'm not, I wasn't looking for him to win, but I was very surprised that he was not uh, in it, and I think that was one where narratives just start to take you start to take the uh, the the place of what's of what's happening um okay then we have Ohio State Clemson this should be a good game because I think these two teams are actually kind of similar in that one loss but they, they were both teams were trying to figure out a lot about themselves as the season went on and I think they both have had uh, moments of uh, prolific play and then they've had moments where they're you know fighting for their life to keep the whole thing alive. Um, I mean, I think about the fact of uh, Noah Brown having what who was right here played here in uh, Pope John at Sparta right down the road. He's from Mount Olive. My wife Melanie actually uh, taught him. <laughs> he went to her to her school, and all the other teachers uh, there had him. They say he was a great kid, great respectful kid. But how does he, a guy like like how do they have enough um, in them to score four? to have four touchdown catches against Oklahoma on the road, but then they're struggling to stay alive um, in a Michigan game or they're struggling to stay alive against uh, Penn State who actually beat them. Uh, And then the same goes for Clemson. They only beat – they played somebody low level in early in the season and they only beat them like Um, 19-13. So I actually think this could be an extremely competitive, fun game there could be two point conversions. It could almost go to one of these overtime type deals. This one feels really close to me. I don't. What's the line on this one? Uh, I've got it at. Uh, um, three. So yeah, Clemson's plus three. So. So Ohio State's the favorite. Yeah, and it's strange. It's like what coaches, you know, there might be some medical issues on either sidelines because Dabo passed out one time this year. Herb's got a history of passing. I mean, it's going to be seriously an intense game and very, I, I think it's going to be very fun. Um, it's strange because for as much as I don't like Ohio State, I have the ultimate respect for them. I actually, you know, I picked them to beat Michigan. I didn't want to do it, but I did. And, uh, you know, because I don't like Ohio State at all. I just don't, I don't like anything about them. But you and, like Urban uh, though, right? I don't like him either, but I just, I, I don't like him. I just, in terms of like putting your money, like the guy just is, is ridiculous when you compare him to other, you know, quote unquote, big time coaches. He reminds me of your dad for some reason. I know I'm stating the obvious, but it's like Dabo might be, Dabo might match herbs like uh, competitiveness. If that's, if you can even do that, but you're right. Ohio state looked great against Oklahoma. I don't know if that was anything on, uh, I, I don't know. And then, you know, you're going through the year, you're going to school, you got different weather, you're getting injured. These kids are kids. So, I mean, right. you know, when you cut, when you get into that game, Herb probably had them focused. They had the month, you know, the summer workouts, whatever. But uh, still a good point. It's strange because they, uh, they, looked, they looked like a totally different team. I mean, when they came out and beat Oklahoma on the road, it's like, damn, these guys are good. Uh, but yeah, that was, we'll I mean, that was, that was an unbelievable game. And you just don't understand. I mean, uh, you know, seven point win over Wisconsin, just beat Northwestern twenty four twenty. Weren't they up in that game big too? Was yeah. it like twenty one nothing? I could be wrong. I you think know, so. You see all these things go through. Uh, killed Nebraska. 
who's number 10. Um, yeah, it's, you know, killed Maryland, uh, just beat Mich- Michigan State. And then the other deal is, and you see this in any sport, NFL, basketball, all of it, uh, but especially football, in division, it's different. It, it, it's like playing your brother in pickup basketball as opposed yeah. to playing someone else at the, like, you know things about each other that, uh, that allow it to be way more competitive than you would otherwise assume. And so uh, people, you know, the tendencies of what coaches do come into play and the competitiveness and what's been done in the past. So sometimes you look at them just beating a, a down Michigan State this year, and it's one of those just survive in advance because you can't look at in-division games the same. I mean, I look at the New York Giants. They just beat Dallas 10-7. They beat Dallas in the first game of the season. I do love that they're the only two wins uh, or the only two losses that Dallas has taken this year. They beat Dallas in the first game by one point. They beat them here by three. They're going to play on the road at Philadelphia and at Washington. And even though those teams are potentially going to be out of it at that point, they're going to be nail biters. When you're in division, when you're in conference, there's so much at play more than just where you are at that moment in the season um, or where each team is. That it and just takes looking, on a different life. Yeah, and everybody's looking to pick up, pick off Ohio State. I mean, even if it's, you know, uh, you know Purdue or whatever. You know, you, you want to be. I mean, you want to knock the top guy off the off the, you know, off the lead. So. Yeah. So they were up. Uh, they were well. They were up seventeen ten in that Northwest. Yeah. I don't know. And then it was tied. It was tied seventeen. 17- 17 actually yeah you're gonna get everybody's best effort from you know northwestern or purdue uh well these are good these are good teams who recruit who i mean geez i I know michigan state got killed but they were they were in the final four last year um so you just and the guy who the guy who was the quarterback on the team this year beat ohio state last year in columbus so it's uh yeah you just never know but i think that first of all there's no gripes with the final four right um you know, Michigan instead of think, Washington, maybe, but you can't put two teams yeah. who weren't in the final. But see, I think, I think, but see, I thought, I thought they probably. Well, no, you can't. I guess you can't. Do you that. just can't. That would be the ultimate. It's one thing leaving Browning out of the Heisman. <laughs> if, if you left a Washington, although these everyone except Alabama though gives you some doubt by having at least a loss, and then Michigan. I mean, Michigan would have been in it. They just had to win that game, which they were up in. And which they had at a fourth and inch play. I mean, they were up in that game, so they really can't complain. This is how these things are decided, and they have to be okay. And I don't think I'd want to. Uh, although it would be fun to have that Florida State Michigan game in play here uh, with this with this group, um, or yeah. even or even to see like Alabama play that Florida State team because they really the key is it, it's when you have NFL players up and down your roster that's what gives you the shot to win any game because these guys are going to go to the next level. I mean, um, a lot of people say that um, uh, Les Miles was in many ways ultimately fired because of Odell Beckham. Because you look at Odell Beckham, and then to a lesser extent you look at Jarvis Landry, and you say as boosters, as a, as a team, these are the best. Odell Beckham is the most electric wide receiver the game has seen. Uh, he's up there with guys for decades. And he was sitting there. <laughs> on the flank and and we didn't we didn't know this i mean kudos to you for being able to uh recruit him and get him here although he's from there so a lot of times the school recruits it just be by being the biggest school in the state but you had this guy and then you had jarvis landry as well and you couldn't find a way to be less is more to be more uh electric and so that's interesting so uh when teams have a quarterback forever right when teams I mean, have you're, NFL you're, players, you you can win at any day. Yeah, yeah. So I'm um, yeah. So we're gonna probably see. Uh, I, I wouldn't the, be surprised I'll, Clemson wins though, but we're I'll probably gonna see Ohio State. We're probably gonna see Ohio State Alabama again for yeah, all the I'm marbles. Kind of ex- yeah, and I think we called that. I, I maybe I, I although I was high in Michigan, but um, and then I did pick Florida State to win it all. So I'm I'm totally digging a hole right now, but. Uh, and I just said I'd take the points because the three points look attractive if you're betting. Um, I think it's going to be an awesome game, and uh, it's going to be. I think it's going to be. A sl- I think it's going to be like a slugfest. Honestly, I think it's going to be a very physical game, 
and uh, it'll probably we'll be physical happens. and electric though too like there will probably be big yeah. plays over the top big runs yeah, I think JT Barrett yeah. is sort of a, a Deshaun Watson light I mean much more light he's much more of a runner um, but I mean like yeah. shit like I mean Clemson you know they they they, they might have won it last year man they were in that game and you think like I don't know. I mean, but what a road to play! You got to beat Ohio State to get the chance to play Alabama or Washington, excuse me. But I mean, that's crazy. Look, getting uh, there two straight years is an amazing feat. This is a hard road to hoe. Um, yeah, and, and and yeah, same to be same thing could be said about Alabama. But they have the but that's what they do down there. You know what I mean? I guess Clemson's kind of doing it, but uh, Alabama will be doing it. You know what I mean? That's what they do. Well, and on top of it, Nick Saban having like this, I mean, think about how in six years they've gone from us understanding what Nick Saban was, which is just getting big um, single use type players, uh, not a lot of electricity to them. They're athletic and they're going to be good cogs in the NFL to finding a way in midstream by already being a championship team and in midstream turning into the type of place that has those type of guys and has the best, most electric top recruits. Um, when you think about over the years who their no-name, nondescript quarterbacks are, the kind who uh, Alabama is their, uh, is really the last stop on their football career, even though they're manning teams that are winning championships, they're not going anywhere in the NFL. And now they have a quarterback who is a freshman who potentially, uh, if he – continues to progress as he has uh not bad being undefeated dual threat here uh who who could play at the next level after uh you know a handful of years uh learning the trade the right way but this new dual threat aspect and they're just littered with skill players with defensive players athletes hybrids i mean look at what landon collins is doing for the new york giants this year I mean, this was a guy I didn't even hear of him in college, and he's he could be the defensive player of the year in the NFL this year, playing this strange hybrid safety linebacker, um, cornerback type position, sort of like Jabril Peppers a little bit. Uh, but it's 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 fascinating what he's been able to do without dropping off along the way. Yeah, that's uh, it's an institution down there. Um, I was talking to a few few Alabama fans when we were down there and <clears throat> the beginning of the year and stopped in Tuscaloosa and uh, talked to some people that it's just, it's just the way it is. It's just incredible. I mean, you know, the position, each position has its own coach. And then, you know, Sark, Steve Sarkeesian left Fox sports two days before the game against USC in Dallas. And uh, he was already doing peripheral. Uh, he was on the periphery periphery of Alabama, even though he wasn't pay- being paid. Um, so yeah, that, their, their, their whole, their whole entire operation is just set up for them to succeed. And that's what they do down there. You know? All right. Our last thing I would say, cause there are four more games, but I'm not interested. Florida, Iowa, Western Michigan, Wisconsin, Auburn, Oklahoma, I guess could be fun to just, you know, check in with, but uh, USC Penn state, Penn state is probably mad. <laughs> They win this thing, and they're on the outside looking in. Uh, a good bowl, though, Rose Bowl. Uh, they still had two losses, though. You can't have that. If they had one loss, that would be different. Um, yep. But they're playing USC, who is a rising 9-3. and three. They're a totally different team than, uh, than we saw in Alabama. Are you? What are you looking at in that one? You know, it's so hard for me not to – you know, I've, I've – I have, I've, a co-worker who uh at the supermarket who's a uh, penn state fan and he's not a jerk he's a nice guy great guy actually and uh you know the penn state quarterback is exciting but he's small jamal franklin might get the coach of the year actually um james great story james franklin. yeah franklin yeah great great story right but you know what i, I mean it, it's just so hard for me to be you know you know, I got to let go of the past and, and, uh, and it's just a game. You know what I mean? It's basically a home game for USC. They're peaking at the right time. Um, six and a half points. I have them as the favorite. <clears throat> um, I think plus you know, they're home. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, you know, not to mention what we did, you know, they got food poisoning last time that we played them in the Rose bowl. Joe Pa's last, uh, 
Rosewell, I mean, I hope the Trojans, you know, beat these guys by 40. You know, I, I, I just don't understand. Uh, I'm more upset at USC that they started one and three than I am at Penn State. But then it's, you know, and I, this is kind of, uh, you know, immature, but I'm going to say it. You know, the fact that, you know, uh, NCAA violations were taken, you know, you know they, they placed the four-year ban on Penn State, but then they switched it to two. And, uh, I mean, you know, and, and USC had the four years. I mean, you know, I think this is poetic justice, and I hope, I hope the Trojans beat them by 40 because, uh, you know, yeah, they did win the Big Ten, but, you know, they're not the best team in that, you know, in that conference. No, they, got the, one, they got the one win they needed to, to get, and they have come back. 11-2 and two is, is good for, for And a great, you know what, and I'm not, it's it just, you know, if they're playing Oregon, maybe I wouldn't be so uh, invested in it. But I just, uh, you know, it's funny how some of these things work out, and I just hope Southern Cal rolls up on them. I really do. But we'll wait and see. It should be an exciting game. And um, getting back to Western Michigan, uh, Western Michigan, I'm surprised P.J. Fleck didn't, you know, jump the boat or whatever. Uh, you know, I guess he's, key, he's continuing to row. Um, up in Kalamazoo, I thought he he might have uh, bailed, but I think he's going to wait one more year and then uh, make the big jump to uh, a bigger a bigger school, bigger uh, spot. Cool. Well, I think we've gone through the entire roster that we care about here of games, and it's going to be a lot of fun. And we will probably pick it back up for the uh, for the championship game. One final college football podcast. Yeah, that's if uh, Brooke Lopez doesn't get dunked on again. Yeah, but you know what? I keep saying Brooks made seventy-five million in his career, so he's probably like, "Hey, that's all right." Can you imagine seventy-five of co- million? Of course, seventy-five Did million. He? And his brother's done pretty well too. He's probably made he's half in that. Chicago, right? He's in Chicago now. Yeah, but he's secretly kind of made. I bet you about half that. Um, so, pretty good family uh, investment there. I'd love to be those parents. Um, so. Yeah, we'll see where we we go with this, but it'll be the big boys will be fun. Uh, the rest of the roster games, uh, we'll see. There will probably be some magical moment that pops up as happens in sports, but uh, we'll be there to watch and we will we'll pick it up later, Matt. Thanks. Hey, thanks, man.